welcome. In a way, doing this at home worship is the perfect setting for today's scripture because today's scripture hits right where we live. And that's a whole mixed bag because if you're anything like me, if you're anything like every other human being alive, you have mixed feelings about right where you live. There's certain things that are going perfectly. There's certain things that are going all right. There's certain things that you wish could be uh, going better and you have hope for. And there's things that are totally on the other end of the spectrum. Things where it's, it's all come to pieces. Things where it, it went bad and it's gone from there to worse. And that's right where our scripture um, speaks. And so right where you are is right where scripture has a word for you. So it's just to say, right as you get started, you're in a very good place to hear what the Lord has to say to you today. So that's a nice preparation. In a little bit, there'll be time for some reflection and there'll be those questions too to continue to prep you and draw you even deeper into the Lord's word for you today. Blessings. A reading from the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. <clears throat> when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities, it consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. 
For I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, you don't have to exactly be a Bible scholar to understand that passage we just heard, do you? No, no, this passage is all too clear. In fact, unfortunately, it depicts the kind of troubled waters that we all know all too well. In today's scripture, God and God's people are at an impasse, and, well, it's been a long time coming, too. God has been loving on God's people their entire life. Only for all that, the more God has loved the people, the more God's people have turned from God. And now, at long last, it appears as though God has decided enough is enough. We can all relate to this, can't we? And what's more, we can relate to both sides of the strained relationship. We can, we can all relate to being jilted, and we can all, unfortunately, relate to, be, to being the one who has done the jilting. All right, now, let's try this. Think of three relationships in your life, and, and for the purpose of our exercise, think of three relationships that are going well. While you do that, I'll talk about nothing in particular, so feel safe to think about these three relationships without missing anything important. First of all, uh, let's keep it to good relationships. And second of all, because it's pleasant, or, well, second of all, let's keep it to human relationships. And then lastly, because it's pleasant, you might even think of the person's face that you're thinking of. So I'll be quiet for a little bit so you can do that. All right, I just did it too. It makes it feels good to think about those ones. And if you need more time, just just hit pause. You can do that, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I added the qualifier human relationships because of my spouse. I knew that if I didn't say human relationships, Amanda would think of our two dogs and some bear from the internet. <laughs> but what I want you to do now is to think of one characteristic from a relationship that has made it good. And to let you th come up with that characteristic. So what I would say is choose one relationship and then think of a characteristic about it that you like. And um, while you think about that, I'll talk. And first of all, it doesn't, that characteristic, it doesn't have to be in all three relationships. I just asked you to choose three relationships so you'd have a large pool to draw from. And, and while you're thinking, I'll tell you what mine is. The characteristic I thought of is earnestness. Uh, for me, I mean, earnest is an old-fashioned word, I know, but uh, you might say sincerity, but I think earnest works really well. Because you see, for me, what matters in a relationship is knowing where someone is coming from. It helps, it helps put me at ease. So you can make of that what you will, but it's important to me. But what about you? What is that characteristic you think of? And if you haven't thought of one, hit pause. And if you have thought of one, Say that characteristic out loud. If you're by yourself, it'll feel a little silly, but first of all, who cares? You're by yourself, who's going to know? And secondly, it'll, it'll make this exercise be a little more real for you. And what's more, thinking about these characteristics is a good idea because knowing what matters to you in relationships can help you be a bit more intentional about them. Because relationships, they're important, aren't they? But relationships, they are as important as they are difficult, aren't they? So we could use all the help we can get. In today's scripture, though, the problem is it is too late for any of that, isn't it? In fact, if you want to relate this exercise we just did to today's scripture, what you've got to do is imagine a relationship devoid of the characteristic you thought of. Or worse, a relationship full of the opposite sort of attributes. Uh, for instance, in my case, it would be a relationship that was full of uncertainty and even downright reception, downright deception. It's not very pleasant to think about, is it? But unfortunately, it's also not that hard to imagine either, is it? No, life has more dysfunctional relationships than we care to admit. And if we're honest, we must confess that we ourselves are the perpetuators of these dysfunctions more regularly than we wish we were too, aren't we? That unpleasant kind of relationship, though, that's the kind Hosea is describing in today's scripture. 
Hosea is depicting God and God's people at the point when families find themselves in therapy, or maybe even a little after that, at that point right before the relation fizzles out for good. Before we proceed, I want to draw your attention to something. The temptation is to focus on behavior, but if you listen carefully, you'll notice that's not exactly what Hosea is describing, is it? No, Hosea is describing how deep the pattern goes, and it's much deeper than mere behavior. No, the real problem, says Hosea, is what makes for real problems in the rest of life, too, and it's, it's not behavior. No, the real problem, the real problem is the cycle of it. The real issue is the pattern of careless conduct. God's people, they are stuck. They are caught in a cycle of dysfunction. They are trapped in a pattern of trauma. And we, we can relate to this, can't we? We can relate to this. We all have relationships in our life that are under strain, if not outright destruction. It's November now. You can just look around and see it's November now. And that means we're about to spend the next couple of months being force-fed depiction after depiction of happy families gathering around well-lit tables full of perfectly cooked food. And while those portrayals have an undeniable appeal, they couldn't be further from the family life Hosea describes, could they? No, they could not. (laughs) The world shows us flawless families full of people who never misbehave, sharing meals that always come out just right. And everyone always enjoys the meal in perfect moderation, too. (laughs) And no one ever steps on anyone's toes, either. And everyone is constantly smiling to boot. But in today's scripture, Hosea describes something else. In today's passage, Hosea depicts the all-too-real repeated offenses with all their usual sorry consequences, too. However, however, it is right at that point when Hosea's tone unexpectedly shifts. When it comes time for the hammer to drop, Hosea says something unanticipated. Without warning, Hosea Hosea speaks a word that breaks all the old patterns. Suddenly, suddenly Hosea speaks a word that says something new for once. And out of the clear blue, as they say, as in out of heaven, Hosea speaks a word. A word, Hosea tells us that question, God won't stop asking. How can I give you up? How can I give you up? The world shows us that we must make our families come out aright ourselves. But Hosea uh, Hosea declares that God is for people who can't help themselves. Hosea proclaims that God is for people stuck in dysfunctional patterns and broken relationships to Hosea. I'll just say it. Hosea preaches that if you are not really perfect, you really have a place around God's table. The thing about those perfect gatherings is as seductive as they may be, they never happen. (laughs) And, and, the, and they never happen because they don't really exist. And they don't really exist because the perfect people who put on these perfect gatherings aren't really real themselves either. And that is why Hosea will have no truck with them. Airbrush depictions of glamorized families savoring idealized meals are fake. God, though, is for real. And God is for real people. God is for real people with real families. God is for real people who have really gone through the ringer. God is for real people really caught in cycles of dysfunction. And God is for real people who really perpetuate these patterns themselves too. For me, this cycle most comes out when it comes time to visit family. Amanda, my spouse, she can tell you that, when it, uh, that I've got this terrible anxiety when it comes time to visit family. And I don't know why. There's no good reason for it, not really, but I can't help it. And it's awful. But I'd be willing to bet it's no different for you. Sure, it may not be visiting family that gets you all tied up in knots, but it can just as easily be any other thing. It might be that one particular family member. Or it might be that chair that sits empty. Or it can be that long-standing grudge that no one remembers how it got started and yet it still casts a shadow, casts a shadow over every family gathering. 
We all have places of pressure in our family lives, don't we? We all have branches in our family tree that are broken. We all have places in our life we can't fix, and we all have places where we have done the damaging ourselves. And for us, those places are God forsaken. For us, those places are ones to get out of as quickly as possible. But Hosea, Hosea tells us that those are precisely the kind of places and exactly the kind of people God shows up to every time. The Holy One in our midst, says Hosea. The Holy One in our midst. Today's passage gives us a glimpse in the very heart of God, and it's striking at just how relatable it is. Like us, God uh, grieves. Like us, God gets upset. And yet, and yet, unlike us, God won't give up. God won't give up. God doesn't give up. God won't quit on broken, hurtful people. How can I give you up? God refuses to quit asking. And that, believe it or not, is really the part of Hosea's message you can really relate to most. It's not how relatable God's heart is. No, what's really relatable is how sticky of a situation God determines to show up in the middle of. God has resolved to plop thyself right into the middle of of patterns that began from nearly the very beginning and haven't shown any signs of stopping since. I'm talking about, if you haven't already guessed, capital S sin. That day in Ephraim, God determined not to come in wrath. And in Jesus Christ, we we witness how God has determined to come instead. And in Jesus Christ, God comes in mercy. What's more, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God comes in the mercy of Jesus Christ over and over and over again, including right now. That just happened. You and the Holy Spirit just had a head-on collision, and you were in the wrong too. But get a load of this. Get a load of this. On account of Christ, on account of Christ, all your sin and all your wrongdoing is accounted for. And it's accounted as forgiven. All, all, all sins pardoned, all debts paid in full. And all means all, by the way. In Jesus, God takes all of our ingrained habits, which is just to say sin, and God puts it all on the cross. And on the cross, all those old patterns die out once and for all. And that's it too. When the cycle spins out, that's the end of it. Kaput, you got it? In Christ, the cycle of sin and death has lost its power for good. In Jesus, God has broken the chain of brokenness now and forevermore. In Christ, that pattern is now the resplendent mosaic of redemption and self. In the cross, you do not just witness the death of Jesus. No, on the cross, you behold the death of humanity at its most entrenched in sin, its most broken. And observing that only makes what you behold three days later all the more gloriously unexpected. In Jesus' resurrection, in Jesus' resurrection, you get a peek at the new humanity Jesus has come to rebirth. In Jesus' resurrection, you get a glimpse of the undoing of our age-old redemption. In Jesus' resurrection, you, you get to witness you get to witness, you get to behold the redoing of a new humanity reborn in the restored image of God. And that is not all, not by a long shot. In your baptism, you don't just contemplate this miracle. No, in your baptism, you are reborn into this miracle. And you are reborn into this miracle over and over and over again. And if you're not baptized, reach out to us. God is not stingy with this miracle. In your baptism, you are a new creation. In your baptism, the old has passed away. In your baptism, you died. You and your old life died. You and all those And all those age-old patterns died, and from that tomb arose a new new creature, a new creature, or a new creation, (laughs) but a new creature, a new creature who lives in Christ and Christ alone. You can say with Paul, it's not me who lives, but Christ who lives in and through me. A new creature who lives by faith and faith alone. A new creature who lives in the fullness of that love and freedom too. 
In Christ, the, the power of those old sins have been broken. They have no power over you anymore. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you really are forgiven. You really are made new. You really are set free. This passage is not just about God's determination to love. It is about whom God is determined to love. And it's not just airbrushed, idealized families that don't exist. No, it's real people. Real people with real cycles of dysfunction. Real people who have really gotten themselves into it. And real people who really can't get themselves out of it either, too. We have been fed a steady diet of fabricated families gathered around fictionalized tables. And after a while, we start to believe that's how it is with God and God's table. Only it's not. It's not. No, God's table is for real people. And what really holds real people around God's table isn't any sort of perfection we dream up. No, it is God and God alone. It is God's love. It is God's love that refuses to give up on a single one of us. And yes, by all accounts, that includes you by name. And yes, me too. Thank God. Thank God. And one last thing, if all this makes you uneasy, if, if this hits too close to home, or if it sounds just a little too well intimate, well, I could give a rip. It is true. It is true. God is a lover and you are desirable to God, and the sooner you get used to that, the better. As God asked that day in Ephraim, so God has been calling out throughout all the ages, all the way from the very foundation of the world up to this very instant, how can I give you up? How can I give you up, God asks. How can God give you up? And if you want to hear your name with your own ears, reach out to me, and I will say it because God never tires of asking. And, and God is always calling out your name with a divine love that knows no bounds. How can God give you up? The good news is God won't. On account of Jesus Christ, God refuses to, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God never will either. Amen. Amen, there's nothing else to say, is there? No, there's not. The only reasonable response is to swoon. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have some time and you can pour out your heart to God. And a little bit later, we'll have the words of confession. And, and a little bit later, we'll even have a love song for you to join in singing to. Amen. Thank you.
And so now, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what we'll do now. We will rejoice. Our service will continue with a, a, a hymn. Let us sing together. and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now as we prepare to conclude this time, we do so with, with that prayer that we've said so many times that has strengthened us and comforted us and sent us so many times, and it does so once again right now. So, gathered by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so as far as announcements go, we're in the fall now, so things like Sunday school, and confirmation, and Bible study, and book group, that's that's all going on. There's fellowship events too, and we've got a collection going for... Um, for the food bank here in town, and, and there's plenty of other things. And a good way to find out what's going on is to check out our website. And at the end of this service, it has our website there. It's also in the description. You could also reach out to us via email or give us a call. And a very good way is to join us here on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., where we have worship each week, where there's always communion, and where all are welcome. <laughs> and that, that includes you. We're certainly not perfect, but we gather under the Lord who is, who forgives sins, and makes us more than we would be on our own. And um, that's the kind of community we find it um, just a joy and a privilege to gather and be a part of. And it would be our joy and privilege to worship with you as well. So, you know, that's it as far as announcements go. I don't believe I'm leaving off anything too important. And so now, so now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.